In 2024, 299.4 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Preventing, mitigating, and responding to humanitarian crises is a challenge. Can fiction and storytelling play a role? Can it raise awareness and motivate action to address the causes and consequences of humanitarian crises? My name is Ruth Mukwana, and I host the Sahapod Stories and Humanitarian Action where I discuss this question with humanitarian practitioners and writers. Welcome to Saha Podcast, Stories and Humanitarian Action. I have a great guest for you today. Before I introduce him, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel at Saha Podcast. And if you enjoy this interview, please share it, comment, and like it. My guest today is Robert Al, who writes fiction and nonfiction. His short stories have appeared in dozens of literary journals, including Mississippi Review, The Common, The Literary Review, Philadelphia Stories, Quarterly West, Consequence, War Literature and the Arts, Baltimore Review, and many more. His collection of short stories, She Received the Night, was published by Vine Leaves Press. His nonfiction account of a year spent in Iraq, Nights in the Pink Motel, was published by the Naval Institute Press. His novel, The Way Home, was published by Debut. For many years, Robert was a diplomat, holding positions in Bolivia, Ecuador, Spain, Mexico, Germany, and Washington. He has served as diplomat in residence at the University of New Mexico and Georgetown University. He has degrees from Princeton and John Hopkins. He lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you. Thank you for making the time. Um, so first, I'm going to ask you to tell me about your writing. What kind of writing do you do? Well, I, I've done all kinds of writing. Um, at the moment, or for the last few years, it's been just fiction. I do, um, and I've been trying to concentrate on short stories, simply because it's my favorite form. Sometimes I get distracted and write longer things, but at a certain point, it's hard to get it published, because uh, anything over 8,000 words, it, there aren't many marketplaces for it. So I try to, I try to write uh, more concisely and um, just do stories and then move along one to the next. All right. And I know we are going to talk about two of your short stories, but what inspires your writing? I, uh, <laughs> almost anything. I don't, um, almost anything that I've uh, experienced or observed or read about um, Almost anything, really. I can overhear somebody say something in an airplane, or I can watch somebody play, children play a game in the street, um, or I can wake up and I've got a story in my head. There's, there's uh, all, all sorts of things, all sorts of things. There's no single uh, source of inspiration. Right. And uh, how about trouble sleeping? What interest, what inspired that one? Well, that has a very specific origin, um, it, which I thought about after you first contacted me. I was at the Virginia Festival of the Book uh, about 12 years ago, and there was a, a reception in the garden of the president of the University of Virginia. I sat down on a retaining wall next to a woman who was an Australian, and we began talking. She told me, gave me the kernel of the story, which which was that a woman had left El Salvador with five children and claimed them as her own, but they were not. And when she arrived in in Australia, the woman I was speaking with was the social worker assigned to the case. And I took the story on board and thought about it and wrote about it, um, drawing on some experiences I had had in, in El Salvador. 
not many, just, just a few experiences in El Salvador, but a lot of experiences in Latin America. Right. And how about child in a bubble? Oh, Lordy. I am so disturbed by what has happened in Ukraine. Um, just think this is a, such a horrible tragedy. And um, all you see on the news are these pictures of buildings blown up and people being uh, rescued. Of course, now we, we see the same thing in Gaza. But uh, the story was written a year or so ago, I suppose. And I began to think about a single child who is rescued shortly after birth and what kind of future that child would have. And so I invented a future. So the story is set 20 years from now, 25 years from now, as she looks back and tries to determine where she has come from, how that happened, who rescued her, and how her life has developed. So it was pretty much a, an act of imagination on my part. Right. No, and, and, and Ukraine is, is on the news a lot. Um, Gaza now as well because of the fighting. And one of the things I love, not I love necessarily, but the thing that the reason I, I really do these interviews with writers writing war fiction, you know, fiction set in conflicts is how writers like yourself are able to really portray the impact of what's going on in this conflict on, on people. And Child in a Bubble, you know, 20 years later, the reader can see how this child's life really, and the, the parent as well, the father, how this still haunts, haunts them both. And of course, those that he left behind. Well, that's the... I've been in war zones, um, and I follow war. <laughs> Who doesn't? And it's it's this impact on human beings that is uh, impossible to to accept. Uh, there's there's no real answer as to why war is a good thing. <laughs> it is not a good. Uh, the principal victims are women and children. They're, they're, the, they're the bystanders. They, they either lose the father or the man in the family or they lose their own lives. And uh, their, their ability to continue is on from day to day is stunning to me. It's so difficult to, to live under the circumstances of war. No, absolutely. And the trauma of it as well that Israeli uh, talked about, because again, child in a bubble, and we'll talk a little bit more about the other story as well, trouble sleeping. But child in a bubble, uh, there's a moment there, which I think is one of the moments for, for her, where she feels she has to do something, where she feels like, oh, maybe my father is regretting adopting me. Right. But she seems to be searching for something, for an emptiness in her life. And I don't know if she actually ever finds it. I don't either. <laughs> I don't think all these stories have happy endings. Um, I, I think she finds the end of one trail. She finds that she can pursue her identity, at least as far as it goes back into the past. Um, and she has to be satisfied with that. I think she couldn't have been satisfied if if she just ignored it and made no effort to put herself out and, and to try to confront the past this way. There's another line in, 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 in Child in a Bubble that struck me. You know, I think you're right. As the writer, there's a moment where you say, you know, she... She goes and finds this uncle, but she's not sure this uncle really wants to be her uncle. Um, and there's something in there when, uh, you know, you're looking for belonging, you're looking to find yourself, and maybe you find this one 
relative that is still alive, but who may not necessarily want to have anything to do with you. That, that's, uh, well, that's, I think, true enough. The uncle doesn't want to go back. He lost more than she ever had. And that not every not everybody rejoices in these reunions. The complexities are enormous. The distance between the two people is great. Uh, there, there's not necessarily uh, a sense of immediate connection. There has to be some work put in or willingness to put the work in. And this this uncle doesn't see that it's in his interest uh, to try to do that. So she is rebuffed, if you will. And that's that's a hard thing to take. And I think this is a good moment for us to read an excerpt, for you to read an excerpt from one of your stories, if that's okay. Uh, okay, I'd be delighted. I'll read something from Trouble Sleeping. It's, uh, I hope it's not going to be too long. Um, I just picked a, a short part of it. The, we're at the point where the Salvadoran woman is in Australia and is in the loose care of the social worker. The Salvadoran woman is named Marta and Nora is the Australian woman, and they they talk at night on, on the telephone. In her second and third telephone calls, Marta began telling the story that she would modify later on. She lived in a village southwest of San Salvador that operated as a collective under the terms of a land reform. But the coffee the collective produced was still bought exclusively by the finca from which it ostensibly had been detached. Neither the guerrillas nor the rightists associated with the big landowners and the government were happy about this, so each preyed upon the collective in different ways. The rightist paramilitaries stole part of the crop. The finca owners blocked the roads that would lead to the other markets, and the guerrillas taxed foodstuffs and kidnapped children to replenish their cadres of, sol of soldiers. Nora sat listening to this in her dressing room with the door closed and knew that these were accurate, but not crucially important facts. They were a lead up to a certain night in which certain things had happened or began to happen about which Marta became vague, falsifying at first, then edging towards the truth without committing herself to its burden of fear. By the fourth call, both women knew, as did the children in Marta's apartment, no doubt, and David, for certain, lying in the adjacent bedroom, that sleep and night terror were not precursors to their speaking. The first call, yes, afterward there'd been no sleep. There'd only been the waiting for a time that certain time when the raw stuff of consciousness overflowed its cup. Initially, Marta said her house was the first one attacked because her husband was one of the cooperative's leaders. He was dragged outside and shot. Then, when the house was set on fire, Marta ran toward the forest with her two children, and the children were shot and a gorilla tore her from them and lunged at her, and she struggled and managed to get away. The shooting spread quickly, as did the fires. The gorillas formed a semicircle and splashed gas on house after house and on some of the people trying to escape, transforming human beings into human torches. Marta scrambled out of her hiding place and pulled a fleeing child into the bush with her, where she hid. Corazon. She saw two more children racing through the flames in chaos and again ran out and grabbed them and pushed them into the corn crib to hide Fausto and Magdalena, who were clutching, who was cut clutching the newborn, Natalie. Then she saw Tino firing a rifle and begged him to come protect her and the girls in the bush. 
And when the corn crib was set on fire, Marta ran out and pulled off the planks in the rear and helped Fausto and Magdalena escape. By now, Nora understood at least part of the confession Marta wanted to make. Share my lie. These are not my children. Marta fled with them for three days toward San Salvador. Once there, she said that all of their documents were destroyed. The whole village was destroyed, and her husband was dead. The Australian relief representatives heard about this desperate family and asked if they would consent to be expatriated to Australia as refugees. Somehow, Marta negotiated all this while racked with guilt. Her own children had died, but not she. Her husband had died, but not she. The children had lost their parents, and Marta feared she could not protect them from the terrible force reposing in the wicked night that eventually would tear them away from her and consume them like all the rest. So that's a piece out of trouble sleeping. Um, I think it's fairly realistic, unfortunately. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for, for reading that. I mean, I, I read it and what, I mean, you use, of course, I don't know if it's, um, should I call her um, an unreliable narrator herself, one of the characters? Yes, Marta is, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and that, in many ways for me, when I was reading the story, I read it a couple of times as well, because I was also going to speak to you about it, of course, but because the first time she tells what is the first truth, that turns out not to be the truth, but it was already extremely violent, what she told, and so I was actually caught by surprise as a reader when she told the second truth, but I'm still not sure if this is actually the truth. It, the truth gets worse and worse, and so she creeps up upon it. She can't really deal with it. Uh, she needs time. She needs to test it out. She needs to gain more and more trust in Nora. And perhaps she feels more desperation to feel grounded where she is, to, to have an anchor there. Uh, for her sake and for the children's sake. So I think, uh, again, I, I think psychologically that's a fairly realistic rendition. People are often unreliable in what they tell you, particularly when what they have to tell you is is difficult. Uh, it really it can, it involves their pain to share it with someone else is, is not an easy task. So, yeah, uh, I didn't think of her as an unreliable narrator in the in the conventional literary sense where the author is trying to play a trick on the reader. Not at all. I was thinking of her uh, as struggling uh, to become reliable and not not finding it very easy. No, and I think you've answered one of my questions, which I was going to ask, which is about, like, is this a way of really trying to protect herself from the trauma of what she has experienced. Oh, I think absolutely. I, I, I think what one has to do is is put oneself in, in the position of someone who's been transported across the Pacific Ocean to a country that's completely and utterly different from where she had been living in El Salvador. Now she's in Melbourne, Australia, in a city. Uh, full of people who uh, are not like her in any way, shape, or form, with customs and institutions and um, ways of responding to issues that are, that are foreign to her. So uh, that, that's, that's so difficult. That's just so difficult. That, that, that takes a, a lot of time, and, and it takes a lot of courage, I think. That's where when we look at uh, news stories uh, and we, the camera scans faces and so forth, every single one of those faces, there's more to it than what you see. And that's what fiction tries to get at, what, more than what you see, to involve you more deeply 
in in the reality of of their plight. Yeah, and in, in a moment, I'm really going to come back to this as well. What you know, because I love to hear your thoughts um, on what you think fiction really does well. But just a little bit, maybe before we conclude on trouble sleeping as well, when we meet the characters, in fact, uh, when they're introduced to the reader, and coming back to your point, like we meet them and they they're portrayed as doing fairly well. Uh, they've kind of assimilated, quote unquote, the children, you know, are managing, they're in school, she has a job. Um, and so, of course, if it wasn't this digging, you know, looking at all of this layering of, uh, of matter, just looking at them, one wouldn't know right. the horror that she has experienced. Well, that's, that's, that's typical. Every day in Harlem and Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and everywhere, every person you look at, there's more going on than you than you see. And there are many people who seem to be competently in charge of their lives, but who are struggling for one reason or another. And uh, again, that's that's something that that interests me. Um, there's no, you know, you you can partially succeed and survive. Uh, for quite a long time without resolving some of that turmoil uh, within you. And many, many people might know you and have no idea because you don't share it, what's going on. And it may not be your fault because you may not know how to share it. Uh, it, it takes a lot of energy to give and it takes a lot of energy to receive. There's got to be someone who's willing to, to receive what's been told. That's that's a challenge too. And so why does she choose to take these children with her? I think if uh, somebody doesn't have children might not understand this. But people with children will understand the the, the gathering quality of of humanity, the the protective instinct, the the, the desire to to reach out and shelter, I think that's uh, very very strong in in people, and particularly in parents or grandparents, uh, that sense that these little ones are are more important than your own life, and so whatever it takes, you will you will make that effort. That's, that's, uh, I think, and then, of course, it snowballs. She doesn't start thinking, I'm going to get five of them. She does not think that. She's, uh, she, she, she's just acting instinctively. Possibilities of inability to ignore what's happening in front of her. So it's not, it's not even panic. She's it's 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 more than it's a strong force of uh this shouldn't happen to you and i'm going to help yeah and uh nora as well um so nora is doing this research you know she meets marta and she's interested in her but what is the role or what's her role really uh in marta's life at this point in the story well, she's got a certain uh is she she's a social scientist really more than a social worker, so she lives in a an abstract world, an intellectual world, a world of trying to contribute to policy formation and so forth. It's at a distance you know from the tangible and the human and she uh she sees an opportunity to get out of that world into another sense of engagement so her 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 motivation is somewhat similar to to Marta's in the sense that she, to reach out uh it's it's a it's a peculiar thing in the developed societies at at any rate all of them all societies probably but the more the higher up you get the more educated you get the more abstract life becomes, the more distant it becomes. And if not empty, 
it becomes a little thin and it 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 removes you from that the ground of your own childhood where everything was real and tangible and colorful and 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 mattered just in and of itself wow it's such a beautiful story and again for those who will listen to this conversation trouble sleeping by robert all it was um published in consequence forum is it also in your collection of short stories uh yes it is yes it is uh, the the collection called she received the night uh, it's the first story in that collection correct and so going back to what you had already spoken about the role of fiction uh, and what fiction can do. So one of the things um, really interrogate on this question is this, 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 on this podcast is this question whether fiction can motivate change, whether it can raise awareness, whether it can really help us understand the impact uh, of war on people. And what is your own perspective on the role of fiction in any of these, if any? It's very hard to document a, a concrete impact. Uh, I've been thinking about the question since you contacted me. And I was thinking about, let's say, the difference between watching a movie about war and reading about it. And what I was thinking this morning as I was walking the dog was that uh, reading requires a, a deeper engagement. The a, a film, which can be very powerful, very unbelievably realistic, does a lot of the work for you. It it it, it you don't you don't have to visualize. You, you, you know the soundtrack is there. The uh, the director has had his hand in in sh in, sh in shaping the way it, you take it on board. In film or in, in fiction, rather, you have to make more of an effort to be part of it, and that actually is what fiction is all about. Uh, it works insofar as it engages the reader in co-creation and co-experience. And with that in mind, I do tend to think that uh, it would dispose people to be more perceptive, empathetic, uh, concerned, observant, to try to challenge oneself to notice the things a writer notices, to make those habits of observation one's own. Uh, or, or to stand in awe of the po human possibility that a writer might present to you uh, in that sense. Yeah, and no, thank you for that. And uh, and I also like uh, one of the things I tend to like about fiction is, for example, if we go back to Trouble Sleeping and also uh, Child, Child in a Bubble, you know, we meet in in and their short stories in you know in a very, in very few pages we really meet we understand the perspectives of several characters and what's going on so if we go back for example to child in a rubble there is really almost four or three main characters there is the child herself there is the parent who um adopts the child there is the uncle she goes back to meet and we really understand a lot, at least for me, reading it in those very short story, but it really helped me understand how the war in Ukraine affected those three characters in a very profound way. And I had to sit with that as I was reading it. When you're writing short stories, you, uh, focus, concentration is really important. I mean, economy is, is really important. Uh, that's, that's one of the great challenges. W William Faulkner. I said once something to this effect, if he could have written Sound and the Fury in 10 pages, he would have. And um, I think he meant it. Uh, it. He just couldn't get his, he couldn't do it. <laughs> He's done, he did a lot of other short stories that did it. But you, you, knew, you knew, you you can't do everything. But you can do some things with a great deal of intensity. and. 
uh, and there is a sense of uh, formal conclusion that short fiction offers. It doesn't go on and on. It's got to it's got to reach something. It could be an epiphany. It could just be an emotional resolution. It it could be a lingering question. But there's got to be a sense that uh, the ending is a fulfillment of the beginning and the middle. So that's, for me, uh, the essence of short stories really is the last paragraph. If the last paragraph has got to understand the preceding story, it's got to embody it in some way. And um, that being the case, probably you can't, have a whole cast of characters. You're going to have a few, um, and uh, or one, who's going to hold the moment for you as the reader. No, I agree, but I think I mean you did it wonderfully so well. Because Chad, Chad in a bubble is shorter than uh, Trouble Sleeping, and you had three mem- quite memorable characters, at least for me, even though they didn't spend so much time on on the page. And with what you've said, I'm also going to go back and read the endings of both stories. So that'd be great. I'd yeah. like that. Yeah. And so I'm going to start wrapping up. Um, probably one, my last question, and I'll see if you have any questions for me as well, is, is there anything you hope, you know, you write about war. I don't know if your other stories are also about war, but in writing about war fiction, is there anything you'd want your readers to take away from your writing? Uh, that it matters. That war matters. That this is a way for you to appreciate that fact. That uh, the consequences are are extreme. They're as extreme as they can can possibly be. And this is not something that gets turned on and turned off with the news or a conversation. It's an ongoing uh, and it's a mystifying uh, reality. When the two wars that we've talked about uh, in Ukraine and Gaza, they're just two of the wars going on. There are many wars going on in the world at any given time. Usually there's a dozen or uh, or 18. And <clears throat> why? What, what, what is, what drives it? And 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 at what cost? At what sacrifice? At what opportunities missed? At what corruption of of the society that sustains the war machine, uh, it, or sustains the the aggressive impulse of uh, the need to impose, as Putin would do in Ukraine? What what in the world is he? think he's going to gain by destroying a country this is this is just a this is a fantastic proposition it's it's really shakespearean <laughs> it, 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 it's it's an extraordinary thing uh act, act of you know willful madness so i would like uh readers through what i write or others write to really get what goes into this to really take it on board and to understand how it matters. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, it's really well said. And part of the reason I like to talk about uh, fiction that is really focusing on war is that because I really feel most, most of us don't really understand how wars destroy lives. They are so easy to start. And you're, you know, as you said, they continue long. I mean, many of them don't end, but even those who, which end, the fighting actively stops. For those who lived them, it really never stops. That's true. That's true. So, when did war become a preoccupation of yours? Oh, I I guess because I've been working. With the United Nations, all of my career, I left at the end of June. And so I've been working in the humanitarian sector. And so all of my professional life, I've really been working in countries facing conflict. And part of it, uh, part of my really job, you know, of course, with my colleagues and everyone else, 
is really communicating the impact of war on the people and then mobilizing resources uh, for us to be able to respond to those needs. But I've often always felt like I don't think we do a good enough job in terms of really explaining how people's lives are impacted. And I feel storytelling and fiction can do that in a much more powerful way than our reports will ever do. What what countries have you worked in in the humanitarian sector? Yes, I've worked in Sudan, South Sudan, Sri Lanka. I worked in Tanzania. Tanzania itself wasn't going through a war, but it had the refugees from DRC, from Burundi. I've worked in my own country, Uganda. Worked for a little bit in uh, some of the countries affected by natural disasters. And of course, in uh, not of course, but I've also worked in the Middle East in occupied Palestinian territory. And then at headquarters, I was working here in New York, uh, overseeing countries in the Latin America, Asia, and the Pacific, and some of the other African countries. Well, in my previous career, uh, I, I followed all those stories, uh, and I still do. I, I still. Uh, I mean, I either have had some exposure to uh, a country uh, or a conflict directly, or I just have a lingering or continuing, expanding interest in what's happening. It, it's uh, people go about their lives and they don't realize what other what's what's at stake in other situations. They don't. South Sudan is, I mean, this is a long story. Uh, it's a barbaric story. So uh, I salute you for for being with them and attempting to, to help. It's the first needs are food and shelter, right? And health care. And then the question of trying to, uh, in the humanitarian sense, the question of trying to deal with what we might call the person. That's hard. That's really hard. And that's, that's, there is this question of communication and a question of trust and opportunity. And, and life is very hectic in the humanitarian sector. You, you, you don't have a lot of time. You've got a lot to get done and you don't have the resources. Yeah. And you're constantly trying to bring them to bear. So it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's a big challenge. And also the, the main frustration, of course, is that humanitarians will respond to the consequence. But really, we need the politicians to find solutions to address the causes of all of these problems. So because really, that's the ultimate solution is stop the fighting. You know, don't right. start it. Stop it. Right. Yeah. And, well, the, and that's what people, people want. When you ask them, people want this. Uh, because once there is peace, they are able to at least start to rebuild their lives, and humanitarians can't really deliver that. That's right. Uh, it, there has to be, uh, unless the conquest is absolutely total, there's got to be a political solution or a diplomatic solution to every conflict. It, there, these things are not ended by guns. Yeah. There, there has to be some some kind of uh, of a, of a sustainable agreement. And the other thing that has to happen is that the humanitarian response and other kinds of responses have to go on past that agreement. You can't, you know, wash your hands of it and say, okay, that's done. On to the next one, because it, it isn't done. The agreement is a first step. Yeah. There's good years of the continuing challenges. Yeah, yeah. Now, thank you so much, Robert, for your time. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, if you have any questions. No, I, I'm just uh, amazed that you found me, uh, found a story that was published over 10 years ago and that you reached out. I'm very grateful for that and appreciative of the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, thank you so much and again I really enjoyed both stories and I'll read also more of your stories as well thank you for listening to my conversation with Robert today 
If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please subscribe to my YouTube channel at the Saha Pod and like, comment, and share this video. Thank you.